Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, so when I was uh, doing uh, the uh, communicating with the speakers, I asked them to send me their present slide presentation so that I can share it with you guys uh, with the Dropbox. <coughs> and uh, I was checking everybody's slides to make sure that everything is fine. I was looking at Dr. Jaffe's uh, presentation and I noticed that she was saying CBT doesn't work for misophonia. And I was saying, oh, that makes my job difficult because I'm going to talk about CBT for misophonia. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so nevertheless, we're going to proceed with this. <laughs> and uh, so, the, uh, the, so it's a brief overview of the CBT program uh, that we use for uh, people with misophonia-related distress. And uh, so we, we offer six sessions of cognitive therapy. And um, so those six sessions, they, um, basically the idea for it is to, to help them to, to identify the negative thoughts that goes through their mind, which leading to that negative emotional reaction that they have with, uh, with certain trigger sounds. And the idea is that if you break that vicious circle that is going on with all of those trigger sounds, then the sounds still obviously exist, but they don't have to pay attention to them as much. It makes it easier for them to ignore that. But as long as the sounds are triggering a vicious cycle of anxiety or other negative emotions, this is much harder to actually ignore those sounds. The sounds become to the center of the attention. There is actually research evidence suggesting that any type of a stimuli, if they are emotionally significant, the process of them are enhanced in the brain. So if a stimuli creates anxiety, um, anger, irritation, it is more likely for it to stay in the focus of the attention and uh, compared if it was a neutral stimuli. So with cognitive therapy, the idea is that to make the stimuli, make the emotional reaction caused by stimuli a neutral uh, emotions by working on the thought process. So the first session of cognitive therapy, the idea is to use an in-depth interview to explore whether the distress they're experiencing is in fact related to misophonia or it may be related to other anxiety disorders. And uh, so in our clinics, because this is within an audiology department, so if, the, if we decide that the distress they're experiencing is not exactly because of the trigger noises, and it is mainly because of some other psychological disorder that they have, then we will not proceed with the, with, the, with the therapy. We make a case for the patient to be referred to psychology colleagues. And within that very first session, once we decide the distress they're experiencing is linked to their misophonia, then uh, we create a cognitive behavioral model uh, or formulation, which can explain that mechanism, which I'm going to uh, share it with you. And then we enhance the patient motivation to do cognitive therapy, and then uh, we offer them a, 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 the therapy, and it is up to them whether they want to take it or not. In the second session, we, we help them to design a behavioral experiment. And the experiment, uh, although it is called a behavioral experiment, is actually a cognitive intervention. So they are doing an experiment to create a, a cognitive change, to try out, to test some of their uh, assumptions that they are making. And they have to do the behavioral experiment as a between session assignment. And then in the third session, when they come, we review the behavioral experiment. And uh, usually what happens, there are a range of negative thoughts that has to be tested within that experiment. And it is likely that some of those thoughts will be proven that they were, did not actually happen in a way that they predicted them to happen. So in, those, in this third session, we are going to help them to, to modify those thoughts to more encouraging, uh, not negative thoughts. And then we also, that's the first cognitive intervention that we offer them, is the use of the behavioral experiment. The second cognitive intervention is the use of thought and feeling <coughs> diaries. And uh, that's also provide an opportunity for them to identify the distress linked to their misophonia any time that they're hearing a noise that they trigger the reaction and it bothers them, they, they are instructed to make some notes. First of all, what was the event? What happened? 
and then what went through their mind when they had such noises and then what did it make them feel so they have to fill in these columns and then they come back at the next session to the uh, to the therapy and then we work on those thoughts and help them to modify them effectively during these six sessions of cognitive therapy the patient has to learn how to first of all identify when is it that it is needed for them to use cognitive therapy skills and that would be whenever they are affected by those noises. Second skill that they need to learn is to identify what goes through their mind when they're hearing these noises. And the third skill is to be able to push that thought away and think of a new counter statement or a positive thought which is relevant to that scenario and then move on. So these three skills of the CBT is what they will be learning during those six sessions. And the, the purpose of the six session is not to cure them or treat them with aphonia. The purpose of the six session is for them to learn these CBT skills so then they can apply it and uh, minimize the impact of the problem. This is an example of the formulation, cognitive behavioral formulation that we created for uh, misophonia. So the trigger sounds, uh, breathing noises, eating noises. So we ask them what is the first emotion that you experience when you're hearing these noises. So it can be anger, disgust, and then a chain of negative thoughts goes through their mind. It will cause me distress, I'll get agitated, it will affect on my behavior with others, it is not fair on them, how can I carry on like this? Why do they have to make these noises? They make these noises to annoy me, they are selfish, so on and so forth. And uh, these thoughts lead to further negative emotions and accompanied by certain physical sensations, mainly anxiety-related or panic-related physical sensations. And then all of these symptoms happen to them. It gives further negative evaluative thoughts of there is something wrong with me. Nothing can help. I must avoid I am not normal, life is unfair, deeper thoughts and meanings. And then this will feed back to the original anger that they had. And as you can see, all of these are cross-connected. When you are more angry, the way that you think is different compared to when you are not angry. When you are very anxious, the way that you think is different and when you are not anxious. That's why they say when you are angry, you don't make important decisions. And when you are in love, you don't think at all. <laughs> so, the, so the emotions does impact on how we think. And also what we think impact on how we feel. If you try to think of uh, uh, some of the saddest stories that happen to people, even without seeing them, just the thought of it makes you feel upset. So the thoughts impact on the feelings, and the feelings impact on the thoughts, creating this vicious cycle. And in the cognitive therapy session, we do explain this for them. And the idea is that the, because of the trigger sound, you have this vicious cycle which is going. And, and if the problem is a vicious cycle, the solution to break that. And so how do we do this? It is very hard for me to ask you not to get angry when you're hearing these noises or not to have any certain physicals and don't feel tense. Because these may not be the emotions and physical sensations may not be in your direct control. However, as human beings, what we can do, we can work on these. We can change our thoughts. Every time that we learn a new thing, change in our thinking happens. We can change our mind. Hence the cognitive therapy. The cognitive therapy will help you to identify these thoughts and modify them should you decide that they are not helping you. So when these two boxes are modified, they, they don't feed back into the whole model and the cycle collapse. And that means you're still hearing the trigger noises, but you're not having this emotional reaction. Therefore, making it easier for your brain to ignore them and not to focus on them. And we are working on this model, making it uh, a bit better, uh, specifically the connections here. We're not entirely sure that these can be a two-way connection. So uh, a, a newer model is going to uh, uh, emerge, which you are actually putting the physical sensations and emotions in, in the same box. So it makes it easier to, uh, to be 
understood. I just wanted to say it was very interesting for me seeing uh, Alessandra's uh, study that actually showed the difference between the hyperacusis group and the Zophonia group in terms of the ULLs. I want to add this to that, that in our patients, many of the patients with misophonia also have very severe reduced ULLs. And this has happened. And so I'm not entirely sure whether there is a cross between um, the two. And, uh, and also Eleonora's uh, presentation about the consistent personality disorders in those patients. I have a, uh, these are three different patients. Uh, so suicidal thoughts, one of them had suicidal ideation, the other two did not. Uh, none of them had pathological abnormalities, no related problems. All three had also hyperacusis. And uh, history of mental health, all three had history of mental health problems. And two of them, their parents, also had history of mental health problems. And then the, the anxiety scores in two of them, they're abnormal, but one of them, the anxiety score was fine. Depression, one abnormal, the other two, they were not depressed. Hyperacusis questionnaire, abnormal in one of them, the other two was not abnormal. And uh, health anxiety present in two of them, not in one. Obsessive compulsive disorder, present in one, not in the other two. Social phobia, present in two, not in one. All of them consistently had a problem with worry, with this Penn State worry questionnaire that we did. A panic disorder, a problem in one, not in the other two. So I think it's uh, very interesting to actually put all of these together in a larger data sets so we can see whether we can find out a, a trend in this. Thank you very much. I take questions. Thank you, Dr. Raj. Uh, so we have a few minutes for questions, and then we'll have a short break. And Dr. Marzar has a question. I think I'm loud enough. Yeah, um, you are. So there is no sound therapy in this model at all? In the model of, uh, no, there is no sound therapy in the model. So, so it's cognitive know, therapy. Right, yeah. so, so, the, so the whole thing is going to be based on you change your thought, your emotion will change, your, your thoughts will change, your healing will get better, so you, you're cutting it up. But what about the fact that in all this time, the trigger is still there? I mean, I see a lot of misophonia patients we go through a lot of these things and say, well, what am I going to do while we're doing this? I can't eat with my parents. I, you, know, you, you know the drill. I can't do this. I can't yeah. do that and all that. But the, trick, the idea is that, so this is the cognitive therapy. It's based on Aaron Beck's cognitive theory. And his idea is that the actual event is not the direct cause of the emotional disturbance. It is the thought process. Which is with that. something in childhood? Or is it at that moment because you're thinking about you know, what Dr. Jack talked about, the evolutionary process that we, were, we went through. Or is it that, that it was a pair at that time? Was it that, you know, the father was doing something bad to this kid while he was chewing, and that's why the chewing now is paired with that time? I mean, what is it that you your thoughts are? They, yeah. I mean, I've read that, I've read all of them, so, I, but you treat yes. them. So exactly, I yes. I don't think that a scenario like that would be the, uh, the case. However, so why people develop thoughts like this mm. is a different question. So that I don't know. Why do they develop these? And, uh, but once they develop these, the outcome is the negative emotions, which will be linked with the trigger sounds, hence make them unable to ignore those trigger sounds. So the, the cognitive therapy, you're starting with other people, they are generating this, and the idea is to help them to understand this and modify this. So they, so the thought changes, therefore dampen down the negative emotional reaction, relaxing that evolutionary system, if you like. Because our brain can has the ability to amplify sounds and focus on them, and well, it has the ability not to do that as well. So and it can change very quickly. And for well, as long as those negative emotions exist, fear being the, the worst, it doesn't happen. So for your patients with misophonia, did it work to have CBT? Well, of course, uh, 
But if you're asking, you know, I'm very biased in you know, answering that uh, information, and for two reasons. First of all, is um, I like them you know, to improve, but nevertheless, we don't. We only offer six sessions, whether they improve or not. And and these three patients that I discussed, yes, they did improve. And uh, but you know, this is the the lowest level of evidence. Maybe people who do not improve do not come back for a follow up session. So I don't see uh, those patients. So I can't really. A comment on whether the treatment actually is effective or not, but I talk about the, the mechanics of it, if you know. It's a good question. <laughs> um, it was just a comment about uh, the, the LDLs. Um, I think a lot of the resophonics has spent a lot of time with earplugs and uh, headphones on so that they have got decreased sound tolerance because of that. It's a, it's a good possibility. Um, yeah. So the only problem is that they, with, with just using the earplugs, as the form by studies and Kevin Monroe's uh, studies, if we don't expect a huge amount of uh, reduction, we're talking about 10 dB, 20 dB. For these so, so patients, the URL as well as, well as uh, 40 dB. You know, so it's severely discussed, so I couldn't really justify it uh, with uh, a sort of a central brain theory thing. But it, it's very likely that it's contributing to it. Thank you very much for your your interesting uh, sort of sort of presentation. Do you feel that coupling sound therapy for patients with elevated QL levels and misophonia would be beneficial in in your current model? Not in the current model. I, I think that can be very beneficial, but this current model is solely focusing on cognitive therapy, and uh, so is they have basically to, to face off the challenge and then to basically do this. But with sound therapy, it's, it's a different uh, direction, if you like. It can be combined, but with this model, it focuses solely on sorting that problem without a need for any other intervention. Thank you.